All right, let's get it started here. Uh, welcome. Hi, I'm Tom Harper, Director of Marketing for Avidyne, and this is the webinar, Active Traffic in an ADSB World. I'm joined this evening by George Hernandez from our tech support group. He's going to be my wingman tonight. Okay, here's what we're going to do today. We're going to, I'll do a quick introduction and then we'll jump right in and talk about the problems with see and avoid. Uh, we'll see what the regulations have to say about it and what some of the statistics say about it. We'll talk about different traffic avoidance technology, including TCAS2, TCAS1, TAS, and ADSB. And then we'll have a quick review of SkyTrack 600. And then we'll take on the questions and some of the other stuff. So uh, let's get started with that. Real quickly, Avidyne's, we've been in business for over 25 years, really focused our entire, that entire time on developing avionics for the general aviation community. Uh, most, if not all, of the sales, marketing, and certainly executive staff are pilots, and uh, a lot of the other factory folks are as well, but uh, we, we are, we're passionate about general aviation passionate about flying and making avionics that are uh, reliable and easy to use and that make flying more fun. Our current product line includes the FMS GPS Navcoms, the IFD 550, the 540, and the 440. And then we also have GPS-only versions of those, which are the IFD 545, the 510, and the 410. And I won't get into all the differences that today, but we, we we do have these webinars normally every Thursday at 1 p.m. and 6 p.m. We're doing this one today on Wednesday because I have a conflict tomorrow. Uh, we have digital autopilots, the DFC-90, and also DFC-100. Audio panels, uh, ADSB transponders, both panel mount and remote mount. The Skytrax 100B is an ADSB receiver for 978 megahertz. We'll explain that a little more later. And then the Skytrack 600, which we'll get into as well. Whoops. Uh, in addition, we have two new, brand new multifunction flight management systems, the Avidyne Atlas for business aviation and the Avidyne Helios for rotorcraft. So these are kind of unique new products in the market in that they combine multifunction display capabilities, so moving maps, synthetic vision, uh, uh, approach charts, that sort of thing, uh, along with a full FMS capability and integrated uh, VHF Navcom as well. Those products will be out later this year. So active traffic in an ADSB world. Some interesting um, things to note is that mid-air collisions are a growing concern. The higher traffic volumes are not just in metro areas. There's more and more traffic at the uncontrolled airports. There's more airplanes operating in the same airspace. The, some of these regional hubs are expanding. And uh, there's an increased use, certainly an increased use of helicopters, including for medevac, TV, law enforcement, fire control, paramilitary, et cetera. So, uh, and again, we're kind of in a unique situation right now with the whole COVID lockdown and all that. But that aside, uh, the airspace is typically uh, a lot more crowded. So let's talk about see and avoid. The um, FAR regulations, FAR Part 91113B states, <coughs> excuse me, when weather conditions permit, regardless of whether an operation is conducted under instrument or visual flight rules, Vigilance shall be maintained by each person operating an aircraft so as to see and avoid. So that's what the uh, FAR state about pilot responsibility when it comes to traffic avoidance. The uh, Airman's Information Manual, Section 558, talks about pilot responsibilities further, saying, regardless of type of flight plan or whether or not under the control of radar facility, the pilot is responsible to see and avoid other aircraft terrain and obstacles. The pilot does not expect to receive radar advisories on all traffic. Be aware that the controller may be occupied with higher priority duties and unable to issue traffic information for a variety of reasons. And in paragraph 5510 
regarding controller responsibilities suggests that uh, the controller should provide radar traffic information to radar identified aircraft operating outside the positive control airspace on a workload permitting basis. So, and they go on to say issues, they'll, the controller will issue safety alerts to aircraft under their control if aware the aircraft is at an altitude believed to place the aircraft in an unsafe proximity to terrain, obstructions, or other aircraft. So the onus is really on the pilot. See and avoid is, is the pilot's responsibility. Sorry, I bumped the uh, um, little wheel here. Here we go. Uh, and in, there's an advisory circular on traffic uh, avoidance uh, information that's called Advisory Circular 90-48D. And they're citing uh, information from a study that suggests that the time required for a pilot to visually identify that there's an approaching aircraft out there, recognize that a collision is imminent, figure out what they're going to do about it, and then provide, push those controls into the airplane to, and then wait for the airplane to respond to that control input is about 12 and a half seconds. So that's a, that's a pretty long process in the history of an aircraft coming right at you. <laughs> Uh, so 12 and a half seconds. Now, the good news is virtually all of these, uh, certainly the active traffic systems provide at least 30 seconds of collision warning, which is two and a half times what the normal human uh, response time would be. So that gives you a little bit of a buffer, two and a half times the, the what's typical. Here's an MIT Lincoln Lab study that was done where they took 24 pilots flying in a bonanza on different sorties, flying VFR cross country. Now they were intercepted by a, a Cessna 421 multiple times during each flight. And this is VFR um, conditions outside. The VFR pilots were able to visually acquire the traffic 56% of the time when no traffic advisory was available. So half the time, they never even saw the other airplane. Now, on the times when they were giving a traffic advisory, such as traffic 11 o'clock, one mile, the pilots were able to visually acquire the, air, the, the intruder aircraft 85% of the time, pretty darn good. Now, that also means that 15% of the time, they still never saw the other airplane even when they were told where it was. And that's in severe clear. So no haze, no clouds, no IFR conditions. So when, if you have somebody tells you where the traffic's coming from, that's a huge improvement, uh, but it isn't uh, in and of itself a guarantee you're ever gonna get a visual on that, on that tr intruder. The conclusions that this study came away with were that the ability of pilots to visually detect aircraft on near collision courses is not simply not great. And that see and avoid is a dangerously flawed method for separating especially high and low performance aircraft. So that's where they see more of the uh, problems. And their mitigation strategy was recommendation was to include having a reliable altitude encoding transponder and an affordable, reliable collision avoidance technology in all GA aircraft. Just as the NTSB had previously recommended in 1987, this study was actually done in the early 90s, as you see here in the footnote. Um, so uh, this is pre-ADSB, but ADSB was being developed. So ADSB is the attempt to meet this this conclusion of of getting traffic detection and avoidance into the into the vast majority of if not all airplanes uh, but the the takeaway from it of course is onboard traffic systems provide you with a second set of eyes in the cockpit for an added measure of safety uh, your eyeballs just aren't that great at picking out airplanes out of the sky uh, versus an electronic one nasa averages 577 pilot reports of near in-flight collisions annually U.S. civil aviation averages nearly 16 mid-airs per year. 
This photograph is an actual midair that took place between a high wing and a low wing airplane. And as you can see, uh, you know, the, the low wing air, the, the bottom airplane there, the little Cessna was on short final when the, the low wing airplane descended into it and uh, got hung up in the landing gear there. They both managed obviously to land and uh, both parties managed to survive, which was great news. But it kind of illustrates uh, this problem with see and avoid when here you've got a high wing airplane and a low wing airplane and they're just not going to see each other on a, even on a clear day in the right geometry. So failure to see and avoid is cited in 94% of all incidents. Pretty incredible. VFR pilots spend about 50% of their time on outside traffic scan during cruise and only 40% of the time during arrival and departure. That's for VFR pilots. So that, that the other way of saying that, of course, is over half the time these VFR pilots have their head down. They've they're, they got their head down in the cockpit, either twisting knobs or looking at instruments or and not looking at other for traffic, which is uh, by mandate they're supposed to be doing is see and avoid. So the risks are great greatest between fast moving and slow moving, moving aircraft. We're hearing that again in this study. So I went and pulled the data for the last 40 years, actually 38. The, la the latest data was from 2018, but this goes all the way back to 1980. And about 1985 is when the airlines were mandated to install TCAS-2, which is the original traffic collision avoidance systems. And after that, then this is a, uh, a chart of all pilot reported near mid airs. And you can see those reports of near midairs dropped significantly after TCAS was installed. And then TCAS 1 came in here as well, somewhere in the middle of there. But you can see the slope is pretty nicely down. And then a lower cost version of TCAS 1 called TAS, or Traffic Advisory Systems, came into the market in the late 90s. And you can see there was yet another uh, downward trend that continued um, as, as folks were able to pick up the traffic on a display and not be surprised by it and maybe are, they were making a maneuver a little more a little earlier than than uh, waiting till it you know obscured their windshield and then if you notice here at a, uh, if there's this big blip at the, this bubble at in the at the end of the chart here between 2015 2018 and i kind of targeted uh this is my own observation. And about 2015 is when ADS-B started being installed in earnest in GA aircraft, especially. Uh, of course, the mandate was just for this last year in January, and there was quite a few installations in 2018 and 2019. But as a manufacturer, we've seen uh, ADS-B being installed kind of over the last 10 years, but really in 2015, people started taking it serious. And, uh, and I'm kind of looking at this chart wondering with all these ADSB installations or some percentage of the of the flying public using uh, using this ADSB now, they think they're seeing all the airplanes and are getting are still getting surprised by the the midair of the aircraft that they didn't know was coming or didn't see. So my takeaway from that data is with the advent of ADSB equipage most aircraft are seeing most other aircraft most of the time and really what you hate to do is think you're seeing all of them and be surprised right what freaks you out more than thinking you have all the traffic in sight and then you get buzzed by an airplane you didn't even know was there in the early days of tcas uh, uh, for the previous company i worked for we were developing tcas and I tell you what, you go out and fly on a sortie with TCAS and you'd see all the airplanes that you didn't realize were even out there. When you get into a non-traffic, uh, you know, TCAS or TAS equipped airplane, uh, it'll make you pucker up a little because uh, you really have some anxiety uh, because you don't know what you're missing. You don't know what's out there. And uh, and even folks buying ADS-B today and, and having that planned view of the nearby traffic, uh, it's a lot better than when when you get in an airplane that doesn't have it. But I, I want to share with you some of the, the the issues even with ADS-B and the current mixed equipage, et cetera, and the mixed airspace 
that uh, you may or may not be seeing the whole picture. So here's our first poll question. Have you ever experienced a near miss that was just too close for comfort? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to come over here and I'm going to launch this first poll. And this will come up on your screen if you just reach up and provide a response. Just pick yes or no. And we'll give it a few minutes here. There's a lot, quite a few votes coming in. Starting to settle out a little bit. Give it about three more seconds for those of you that want to vote. All right, that's pretty good. I'll go ahead and close that, and now I'll share that data with you. So look at that. 70% of you have, have been in a near-miss situation where you're like, where the heck did that dude come from? Or why didn't ATC tell me about that guy? You know, that kind of thing. I've I've had similar couple of instances flying into Oshkosh and other places where um, – yeah, it'll get your attention and you, so, you don't soon forget it. All right, let's go on. So let's talk about tra traffic avoidance technology. Again, back in the mid 80s, uh, TCAS 2 was developed and mandated for the air transport category aircraft. Uh, TCAS 2 is Traffic Alert and Collision Avoidance System. It's an active interrogation system. That means that the host aircraft their processor is sending out interrogation pulses as though it were a ground-based radar it's sending out pulses it's waiting for nearby tr the transponders of nearby aircraft to hear those pulses and then reply back the the transponder on those other aircraft thinks they're replying to a ground station they don't know any different so they get a pulse interrogation pulses and they send back a reply with their if it's a mode c they send altitude and squawk code if it's mode a it would just be obviously uh just the uh, squawk information uh, so the tcas would assume co-altitude and then if it's mode s you'll get some extended squitter of course um, so from those computations of sending out those pulses like 50 60 times a second the computer can quickly calculate range and bearing of that target of where that transponder equipped aircraft is and paint it on a display like you see here. This is an IVSI that's been adapted for TCAS 2. So all the airliners had to replace their vertical speed indicators with one of these. And they may also have a bigger plan view on their MFD, but there's also a plan view integrated in the IVSI. But the thing of it is, you got your blue targets here with your other traffic. Your yellow target is a traffic alert, but the red target, which kind of, this is, I have to get a different picture. This was underneath the arrow. There's a red target. It's a square box. It's red. It says there's a, 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 a traffic within 300 feet and it's climbing. Uh, so look what this, this resolution advisor is this red arc around the outside of the IVSI dial. And it's telling the pilot, fly out of the red into the green. Now, like right now. So that's a resolution advisory is saying, it, you'll get a, uh, the pilot would actually get an alert that says traffic, traffic, descend, descend. And in this case, you push the nose down and get that, get that vertical speed needle all the way down into the green arc. That's the only place you're safe right now. Because... The way this uh, particular aircraft, uh, this intruder aircraft, is is uh, positioned. That's the the algorithms have determined you need to dive, not only dive but dive 1,500 feet per minute. Do it now and do it fast. So, all these TCAS-2 equipped aircraft have dual mode S transponders on board. So they're actually doing an air-to-air -air data link and handshaking, and there's logic and algorithms in the TCAS-2 systems that if it tells one aircraft to descend, it's going to tell the other one either to stay level, don't go, don't descend, or even it may tell it to um, to climb. It may tell the other one to climb at, you know, 1,500 feet a minute. Uh, a lot of times what will happen, if it's telling one to, to descend, the red arc on the other airplane will be from zero to plus 6,000. In other words, you can descend. I'm sorry, I have it the other way around. From zero to minus 6,000. You can climb, but don't descend. In other words, don't descend is the command in the other airplane. You get the idea. 
These uh, TCAS2 are, de are designed to meet the TSOC 119. They typically have a range of 40 nautical miles. Again, mandated for air transport. They provide up to 45 seconds of warning for a traffic alert. That's when you get the, tra the target turns from white to yellow. And, another, and, and, and within 30 seconds of warning at 1,200 knots of closure for the uh, resolution advisory. And that's the important uh, metric that you need to keep in mind is 30 seconds of warning at 1,200 knots of closure. So you got to have two pretty fast moving airplanes to get that rate of closure. Um, and it's, it's less about range than it is about this closure rate. So the problem with the TCAS-2, they're great and everybody should have one, but they're super expensive. Again, there's dual mode S transponders, uh, dual four element antennas, dual IVSIs, uh, dual, you know, you got processors and all that. So $150,000 is what the price is now. They were probably a quarter million when it first came out. Um, so they're cost prohibitive for light GA. Well, then they also developed what's called TCAS-1. And TCAS-1 is also an active interrogation system, and it provides the traffic alerts, but doesn't provide resolution advisories. So it has the same algorithms otherwise. It'll get, provide 30 seconds of warning at up to 1,200 knots of closure. It's C, uh, TSO-1, C-118. It also has 40 nautical mile range. And you'll see TCAS-1, I believe it's mandated in all the... Um, any certainly any revenue uh, passenger service over 10 passengers it has you have to have TCAS one um, and you can see the prices are are a little more modest but still cost prohibitive for most light GA at 25 to 65 K and you can see here's a few examples here the Honeywell ACSS system Garmin and uh, the L3 system and that gets us to TAS which is the traffic advisory system uh, traf the traffic advisory system was is basically a uh, a lower cost TCAS one. They basically they they wrote a new TSO C one forty seven. Uh, you could have lower power, uh, twenty nautical mile range instead of forty nautical mile range. There were a few other things in there, but primarily it's uh, a way to take some of the TK cost out of TCAS one, yet provide the same overall level of protection in that. You still get 30 seconds of warning on 1,200 knots of closure. Uh, you still get your targets that turn from either white or cyan to the yellow color if you get uh, one of these uh, traffic alerts. And here's a few examples of some task systems in the world. Uh, Avidine, uh, Avidine purchased Ryan. Ryan developed the 9900BX. Uh, we purchased them in 1995. I'm sorry, 95, 2005. We uh, rebranded the product as the TAS 600 series and made four different uh, price point segments based on range. And while range itself isn't the determinant factor, uh, it does have a, it has, it's, it correlates to the speed of the airplane so that we could now get a price point under $10,000 for the single engine or the slow moving aircraft could still get an active traffic system at a more affordable relative to their whole value of their airplane. And as you move up into different performances of airplanes up through the TAS 620, uh, then you you get uh, a longer range and therefore more protection based on your speed, such that you're always getting at least 30 second warning at 1200 knots closure, regardless of the speed of your airplane. And then since then we've added ADSB in to the TAS 600 and rebranded it as Skytrax 600. So now it's not only an active traffic, active TAS, it's also uh, an ADSB in receiver. So it gives you the, and it melds those targets together and gives you the uh, best of both. Garmin offers a GTS uh, TAS system. The old L3 Skywatch was probably the original TAS in the market. It was a single antenna system. You'll notice all the others are dual antenna. Uh, Skywatch is uh, no longer in production. Uh, they've since replaced it with a Lynx uh, NGT 9000, which does have dual antenna capability and the Honeywell system. Standard traffic symbology for TAS, the open white diamond, what they call other traffic. So just on a plan view display, if the traffic is more than 1200 feet plus or minus, 
and greater than six miles away, it's not a necess it's probably not a threat. And uh, so it's a hollow white diamond or a hollow cyan diamond, depending on your display. And the little arrow pointing up or down tells you whether the that particular target is climbing or descending at a rate of 500 feet per minute or greater. If it gets within 1,200 feet, plus or minus, or six miles, and or six miles, it'll turn to a solid diamond, what we call proximity alert. Uh, it still isn't a threat, and the reason it's not a threat, because it's not closing in at a rate of, th it's not going to hit us within 30 seconds, basically. Uh, so as long as it's just out there, you know, if you're flying in a, um, alongside another airplane, a, a flight of two, or even a you know, another airplane happens to be out in the airspace a mile away on the right wing. Um, as long as it's not closing in on you, that's not going to be a threat. But as soon as it starts turning toward you, this this thing's going to start squawking if it gets, uh, if it calculates some kind of intercept. And then finally, the TA or traffic alert, which is the same for TCAS 1 and TAS, and TCAS 2 for that matter. The TA is indicated by a yellow circle. It calculates the intercept course for altitude and direction. Uh, and you'll get a voice alert. Typically, all the TCAS 2 systems and TCAS 1 systems will say traffic, traffic. Uh, the TCAS 2, of course, in the event of a resolution advisory, would give you a vertical maneuver. I didn't mention that, but there's no lateral maneuver in TCAS 2. <coughs> it's, a, it's vertical only. I believe lateral was defined in TCAS 3, but they never pursued it. It's TCAS 2 has proven to be quite reliable and, and safe. So the beauty of all of these is they're giving you at least 30 seconds of warning. So let's talk about our next poll question here, which is, do you fly an aircraft that has an active traffic system? And so, I mean, active, not, not an ADSB, but one of these active interrogating ones. So let me uh, pull up the next poll. Launch that out. So if you take a second here. And uh, answer the questions. We'll see. We've got some answers coming in. We'll give it a few more seconds. All right. Well, it looks like we've slowed down, so I'll close that and we'll share the results. Well, look at this. So 30% of you have one of the Avidyne active systems, either probably the Avidyne or BX is included in there as well, TAS 600 or Skytrax. You got a few Skywatches out there, none of the GTS. The GTS was a little late to the game, and I think that's getting a lot of, they, they're using that with their, you know, their G, G2000 or something on the bigger airplanes, but uh, you don't see many of those out in uh, normal GA. And 61% of you do not have an active task. I should have asked how many of you have ever flown with it because it's uh, pretty impressive. All right, so I'm going to hide that. And we're back to our poll question. So ADSB, we're going to drive dial into that for a little bit. It's Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. ADSB is an essential part of uh, the next-gen airspace upgrade. And, of course, they'll tell you the benefit is it's uh, – better aircraft visibility and precision at a lower overall cost. Uh, we can argue about who the overall cost being lowered is to. Of course, we're all taxpayers, so theoretically, we're all having quote-unquote savings. Don't you feel it? Uh, <laughs> but what, a lot of it has to do with the, the cost of replacing secondary surveillance radars on and all these ground stations is, is uh, those have moving parts. And they 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 wear out and they get need to be replaced. ADSB ground stations, on the other hand, are just an antenna on a tower. They don't have any moving parts. They you know omnidirectional antenna, um, and they uh, they're very cheap to install and they're cheap to maintain. Uh, lower cost is a better way of saying that. I, don't, I wouldn't call any of it cheap, but um, but that lower overall cost is to the government. Now they've also done is push some of that cost on us as aircraft owners, because now we have to re-equip. So they've deferred some of the some of the cost savings of theirs onto us. But now that you're all equipped with ADSB, theoretically, uh, we're going to realize those costs over a, a longer time. We're going to get um, 
greater precision because we're uh, ADSB out sending uh, ground speed, altitude, and intent. And that's going to mean we don't have to have a bigger, as big a buffer around each aircraft for, uh, for legal aircraft separation. That means they can pack more airplanes into the same airspace with a with the same level of confidence and reliability that you're not going to uh, intercept one another. So um, that's a good thing, arguably. Um, beats sitting in a hold waiting for the traffic pattern, you know, the the approach area to clear so you can land. Maybe you've, maybe they're landing airplanes on uh, uh, parallel runways now because they've got better uh, grasp on on where you are and they're not having to give such a big buffer zone. ADSB was mandated in the U.S. for Class A, B, and C airspace, some E space, and after January 2020, we've been hearing about the ADSB mandate for the last 10 years. It's now upon us. Uh, it's ADSB is automatic in that those broadcasts are sent out automatically without any interrogation from an. We don't have to wait for an interrogation from a TCAS or from a ground station. The transponders are just spitting out your position all the time. It's dependent. That means it's dependent on GPS. That's where we're getting position and velocity information. So the flip side of that is if your GPS degrades uh, or a, a satellite fails or something, uh, theoretically, it's been fine for 20 years, but anything can happen, right? Uh, in the event that the GPS degrades, you kind of lose your ADS-B ability, uh, potentially. And so, therefore, there are still secondary surveillance radars that will be continue to be maintained around the country as a backup. And there's also always going to be aircraft that don't participate in ADSB, and that those ground, secondary surveillance radars will continue to operate as they always have. There's just fewer of them. Uh, surveillance, that's the primary purpose of ADSB, is for traffic separation. And it's broadcast. It's, your aircraft just spitting the information out. It's not request reply, it's broadcast sent all the time. And anybody who has any kind of receiver can receive it and know where those where the aircraft are within radio range, line of sight. Do I have to equip? Maybe moot because we're past the mandate, but the fact is there are a lot of airspace in the US that does you're not going to be required for ADSB. Obviously, any class B, class C airspace, uh, class E. So above 10,000 feet, and certainly in Class A airspace above 18,000, you must have a 1090 ADSB out. Well, even with the mandate, the point of this slide is even with the mandate, there will nearly always be a non-ADSB aircraft you will have to account for. Mandates are in the rest of the world. Europe has a... Uh, a mandate for 1090. Incidentally, in the internationally, uh, internationally, all ADSB out is uh, on 1090 megahertz. Um, uh, in the, uh, sorry, in Europe, there's a, they require diversity mode S transponder. Diversity means it's got a top and a bottom antenna. So any aircraft retrofitting. Has to, if it's above 12,500 pounds or faster than 250 knots, they have to comply with the diversity mode S uh, ADSB out requirement by June of this year. In uh, the uh, in Canada, let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, they've had ADSB over the Hudson Bay region for the high flying airplanes, primarily for the airliners coming across the Atlanta, North Atlantic tracks. Um, they've had that since 2009. And uh, it's satellite based, so they're they're leaning toward diversity as well for the as they're currently writing the mandate for the rest of the country and for GA and everything. So that none of that isn't is is been solidified yet, but they've got a pretty good idea. Uh, and diversity is expected to be required in Canada primarily because most of their they, instead of having ground stations, they're relying on satellites for a lot of their uh, coverage. With the type of terrain they have there, that makes sense certainly. In the United States, where we have all a full, const, uh, not, a, not a constellation, a full network of, uh, I think it's like 143 ground stations positioned across the country, and they're already installed. Uh, they were done in like record time, and 
five or seven years early. So there was no excuse for delaying the mandate because they didn't want it to be them that caused it. Uh, in New Zealand, they, uh, they're in the throes of ADSB equipage as we speak. Uh, they've had a high flyer mandate since uh, January of 2019, but uh, 2022 is their, is their uh, requirement now, and they're equipping as we speak. In Australia, they've had, uh, for IFR, they've had it since 2017, and with the exception of some exemptions for foreign aircraft, which that expires in June. And then uh, Latin America, uh, George is on here. He might be able to add some color to it, but Mexico is January of 2022. And uh, you know, Colombia, Brazil, and others are in the process of uh, solidifying their uh, mandates. You got anything to add to that, George? Uh, no, uh, Tom, you hit it right on the head. I mean, the mandates in Latin America are are kind of in a in a state of flux as they they determine their concrete dates of compliance. But you know, Mexico, Brazil, um, Chile, all the other Latin American you know larger countries are do have impending mandates coming up very soon. So it's uh, it's definitely a ticking ticking clock for everybody. Yep. And note, uh, there's uh, there are no mandates for ADSB in, which is your ability to receive the other traffic and weather as it were in the United States. There is no free weather in the rest of the world. That's a United States phenomenon because no one else has 978. It's, it's, uh, that's only in the US. Acronyms you should know, ADSB, we just talked about ADSR, that's Automatic Dependent Surveillance Rebroadcast. TISB, Traffic Information Service Advisory Broadcast. That's not the same as that old TIS transponder some of you might have had back in the early 90s. Um, FISB is the Flight Information Service Broadcast, popularly known as the Free Weather. And then there's two different channels for in the United States for, uh, for accommodating those frequencies is 1090 ES, Extended Squitter Mode S Transponder, and the universal access transceiver, which is running on 978 megahertz. So let's talk a little bit about what all these mean and what's the differences. So prior to ADSB, and certainly the way it works in the rest of the world as well, and in and, and a lot of the country uh, outside of the mandated areas, a ground-based secondary surveillance radar interrogates transponders of nearby aircraft, uh, just like we talked about with TCAS. So it sends out a, an interrogation pulse on 1030 megahertz. And all the transponders that were within line of sight of that ground station receive that interrogation pulse and then turn around and reply on 1090 megahertz and send back their altitude and squawk in, information, which is then processed and put on a scope for the air traffic controller. So that's kind of the way it works. It's 1030 up, 1090 back down. 1090 megahertz has been on with 1030 and 1090 have been on transponders since the beginning. And 1090, part of the reason they chose 1090 for ADSB is because all the TCAS systems use 1090, all the existing transponders use 1090. It kind of makes sense to do that. As I mentioned earlier, the TCAS and TAS systems actively integrate the transponders of nearby aircraft and provide onboard traffic awareness and collision avoidance. So that, in this case, the uh, the uh, the TCAS airplane sends out a pulse. In this case, to the, the the air transport airplane is sending out a pulse to the um, citation there in the middle, and it's replying back to the air transport airplane. And then the citation sending out pulses to the King Air and the Baron there, and they're replying back. And you're, it's painting this little picture right here. So just like a ground radar, airborne TCAS and TAS interrogate on 1030 and receive the transponder replies on 1090 megahertz. With ADSB, now each aircraft is automatically transmitting their own unique aircraft ID or their address. In the US, that's typically the tail number. In other countries, it's an assigned address you have to go on a website and it'll put in your information and it'll spit out an address for you but like a six or seven digit hex code uh, position information lat long altitude your velocity that information is being spit out it comes down to the ground station 
as you're flying by. Um, and one of the ground stations is always picking you up, and that allows ATC to identify and separate all the participating aircraft with greater precision because we've got that lat long and the intent information. ADSB does not require an interrogation signal from the ground like the old system. Aircraft equipped with ADSB in can receive those ADSB out signals from other aircraft. So in this case, the jet in the center here, he's got an ADSB in receiver, so he knows where those other guys are. Now he's probably got a TCAS system on board because he's a high flyer, but for the sake of uh, illustration here, you can humor me. However, in the US, because of the dual frequency band, uh, there's 1090 megahertz, which can be used at all altitudes, and 978, which can be used below 18,000 feet to meet the mandate. So now you've got an illustration here where from left to right, you've got a King Air that's flying above 18,000, so he has to have a MODES transponder 1090. So he's sending ADSB out down to the ground station on 1090. You've got this Baron that's putting, he happens to be below 18. He's got a 978, um, even though he's probably got a certified above 18, but again, bear with me. <laughs> the 978 out of the Baron is coming in on nine, is going down to the ground station. You can see the ground station now is showing it's actually got two receivers and two transmitters. So it, it can listen and receive on both frequencies. The uh, citation here is sending down and the airliner is sending down 1090 megahertz. All that information is processed at the control center and ultimately makes its way over to the air traffic controller scope. And again, as I mentioned, ADSB is 978 megahertz only in all international airspaces. 970, I said 10, it's 1090 only in international. And in the US is the only place that has 978. So this is where, because of the dual frequency band, where it gets complicated. Uh, I, if I've got ADS-B in, in this case in the citation here, I can see these two aircraft spinning out 1090 because I've got 1090 in, but this 978 I can't hear, and this mode C guy that's not even uh, participating in ADS-B, I wouldn't be able to see him with my ADS-B receiver. So how do we solve that? Well, the other thing is 978 has free weather, in order to get the free weather, you have to have a 978 receiver. So here the Baron's got 978 in and out. So he's getting the free weather on 978. Here the Citation has 1090 out, but he also has a 978 receiver. And even though you're flying above 18,000 feet, as long as you have a 978 receive, you can still get that free weather. And I've got a note here on the side, just as a caveat, because a lot of the high flyers are have been using um, Sirius XM to get their weather. Um, a lot of the, I know I hear from a lot of folks when I'm at Oshkosh or Sun and Fun. Uh, how do I how, you know what do I got to do to get rid of this forty nine dollar a month weather subscription? They went they really were interested in this free weather. Uh, first of all, I say it again, FISB weather the free weather is not available on a ten ninety channel. It's only available on nine seventy eight. It's a ground based service which may have line of sight limitations that are not found with the satellite system. So if you're at a, at a home airport that doesn't have line of sight to a ground station, you might not get any of the free weather until you climb to some altitude um, where with the satellite system, you'll get it all the way to the ground. Also, the FISB weather products have range and resolution restrictions that the satellite system. If you ever flown with XM, you can zoom out your moving map and you get full CONUS weather. You can see the weather over the whole continental U.S. And again, these are U.S. only uh, uh, issues on the weather. This, this products aren't offered necessarily in the rest of the world, with some exceptions. Um, so the FIS products have range and resolution restrictions in that if I'm a, let's say I have a 182 and I'm trucking around, I've got, I'm receiving FISB weather, I'm going to get the weather within 250 nautical miles of me which is plenty for a 182. I mean, it, this FISB is great for GA. Uh, but if you're used to getting the CONUS from an XM, it's going to look different to you. If you zoom out and say, hey, where's the rest of the weather? Why do you care? You know, why should we maybe sending you weather for uh, for uh, the East Coast when you're flying in, you know, in Kansas City out toward Denver or something? You know, it doesn't make sense. 
So they, they, they try to limit the amount of data that's coming up to you at any given time. As you climb up in range, you're going to need to see out further, but they also uh, dilute the resolution of the image, but you get more of it as you climb up. So just a caveat, compared to sat what you're used to, with if you have the Satellite XM, the FISB will be different. I'd recommend get yourself a Stratus, <laughs> watch it, look at it on an iPad compared to what you're seeing with your XM, and then make the decision if you want to really unplug and save your $49. But for GA, FISB is great, and it's free. Um, and by GA, I mean, you know, light single engine guys. Uh, the use of two different ADS-B frequencies, 1090 and 978, can restrict communication between different aircraft. Well, that makes sense, right? This 1090-equipped airplane, so that's the point at the citation here, uh, with the ADS-B in, can see the other 1090 aircraft, but cannot directly see the 978-equipped aircraft, right? Or the non-participating aircraft, the mode C guy. ADSR, the rebroadcast, solves this communication issue by rebroadcasting traffic from each frequency onto the other frequency. So here are the 978 guy is reporting to the ground station, and then that's being that his traffic position is being rebroadcast on 1090 up to this citation in the middle that has a 1090 receiver. Conversely, here we got a, as an illustration. Here we got two 1090 guys reporting their position to the ground station, and in this case, the Baron's got a 978 receiver. He can't see them directly, but he can see them indirectly. So he'll they'll still show up on his traffic scope because of ADSR, the rebroadcast, uh, and it's the latency is pretty low. So you, it's not like you got to wait. You know, it's not going to pop in out of nowhere. You're going to get the traffic you want uh, pretty quickly. But there is a limitation on that uh, I'll talk about in a minute. And can, conversely, now that takes care of the cross frequency. 978 guys see in 1090, 1090 guys see in 978 guys. That's ADSR. Another component of ADSB is TISB. TISB is the rebroadcast of non participating mode C equipped or mode A mode C equipped aircraft picked up by the secondary surveillance radar and rebroadcast on 1090 and 978 so that now this 978 guy knows he's over here and these 1090 guys know he's over here. Again, this is for illustrative purposes. There's other caveats, but you get the idea. Um, and again, this TIS-B is different than the old 90s era TIS technology. As a side note, the old, there used to be a, a, a market for these old TIS transponders, um, and uh, that was they were around certain uh, high density terminal areas, about a 55 nautical mile range around these high high density terminal uh, airports, terminal radar areas, and basically they were spitting out all the traffic that was being seen on their terminal scope was being sent out within 55 miles of that airport. And if you had a TIS transponder, you could see all the traffic, which was great. Then as soon as you got outside of that 55 mile range, roughly, your traffic would go away and it would say, sorry, no traffic anymore. And that was a, a great sales uh, pitch for TAS. I think it, I can tell you that. We had a lot of customers come into the booth at Oshkosh and others and say, I like this TIS thing, but I sure get uncomfortable when it says no traffic available because I flew out of coverage. Uh, I'd like to see that, that traffic all the time, and that's when uh, we would uh, talk to them about an active system. Uh, but at any rate, that was because it was on the same interrogation pulse that's being sent out on the secondary surveillance radar, it was on 1030 megahertz. And as you can see here, TIS-B is on 978 and 1090. It's not on 1030. Uh, it, anyway, the TIS is obsolete, and it's gone away, but You'll you'll hear it called TIS A every now and then because with the advent of TIS B, people just colloquially decided to just call the old one TIS A, but it's really just TIS and now TIS B, the B being broadcast, not the second one. Um, so TIS B and ADSR traffic are part of the whole ADS B thing, and they're only broadcast to aircraft that also participate in ADS B out. So you're not just going to receive this free this this rebroadcast of all the traffic unless you're also participating in ADSB out. So 
uh, you can see over here, uh, to be a client for ADSB, ADSR, excuse me, or TISB, uh, you have to be in a region where the service is offered. You have to have ADSB out equipment on board, and it has to be producing a valid position in the last 30 seconds. So the, the computers on the ground and the radar system and everything, this control station, it's smart enough. And remember, you've got MODES transponders, and the 978 behaves the same way. It's all addressed, so we know who you are. You're sending down your ID. We know you're, you've got a valid ADSB signal coming in. AD, your ADSB out is, is coming into our station. So now we can send up. You say, oh, I know this guy's a, the guy in the center here. We know he's a 978 ADSB in and out as an example here. So we're going to send all the traffic to that guy within 15 miles, plus or minus 5,000 feet. So think of it like a hockey puck that follows that aircraft along from station to station, and it's filled with all the traffic uh, that it that the ground station knows about within that volume of airspace. It's like a just a traveling hockey puck. Again, he only gets that if he's participating in ADSB out. It, that's for ADSR, so it's plus and minus 5,000 feet and 15 miles. For TISB, it's still 15 mile hockey puck, but it's only 3,500 feet plus and minus. It's still a hefty volume of space. Um, so now all of the non-ADSB mode C equipped guys that are within that volume of space will show up, will be sent up on that 978 channel. And that's true the reverse as well. If I'm a 1090 guy and there are 978 guys, I will get a hockey puck around my 1090 airplane as well. I'm just using this as an example. So here's an example where aircraft Y, which for the sake of this example, again, is this King Air over here, has a dual band 1090 and 978 receive only. He's He's got like a Stratus. He's got it thrown up on the windshield. And he's not got ADS-B out yet for whatever reason. Uh, aircraft Y can receive using his Stratus. He can pick up the TIS-B signals that were intended for aircraft X because he happens to be flying through that hockey puck of space. So it's 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 range limited uh, radio waves going up and you can fly through that cone, if you will, and pick up the, the volume of traffic in that hockey puck of uh, air vo airspace volume. But when he flies outside of that hockey puck, he no longer can see that, that aircraft access traffic and he's on his own again. Here's a better illustration perhaps. So now you can see here's air, it's a kind of a different scenario, but it's the same principle. And again, exaggerated for illustration. Here's a TISB client, Aircraft X. He's receiving the one, two, three, four, five targets that are within his 15 miles and plus and minus 3,500 feet. And you can see uh, Aircraft X's dis uh, traffic display over here in the lower right. He's got one, two, three, four, five targets out there. Now, aircraft Y happens to be flying through that hockey puck of airspace and look on his display. He goes, oh, wow, look, there's three targets out there, It's but it's severe clear out here to the left. He may not know, probably doesn't know where this aircraft X actually is necessarily, uh, although, he, uh, yeah, he may not know who it is because it's not reporting itself and may think it's all clear out in front of him where, look, again, exaggerated for illustrative purposes, but now I've got two, maybe three targets that are going to be a real hazard for me. In fact, if I go down one more screen, you can see here, if I overlaid that hockey puck over traffic, uh, over the display of aircraft Y, you'd see he'd be left unaware of the traffic directly ahead of him to the left. So that's that's the importance or the, the problem, if you will, with piggybacking. And uh, of course, the way around that is to participate in ADSB so that you're getting all the traffic. Uh, and not assuming there's no traffic when there is, because you have no other indication of where the dead zone is where you're not receiving coverage. And it kind of gives you a false sense of security when there, there's really no basis for it. So uh, aircraft equipped, on the other hand, with an active traffic system, will see all the transponders, regardless of whether they're 1090, 978, 
or non-ADSB. The active traffic is still important in an ADSB world. It works everywhere. So if you're flying outside the US and Canada, they don't have ADSB. They don't have certainly have don't have 978, but uh, they have 1090 and TAS works in all transponders. It's independent of equipage. We don't have to worry about whether you are or not have ADSB in or out or up or down. It's not dependent on radar coverage, not dependent on the integrity of the GPS signal, and it shows the whole picture. And it's a great supplement, a complement really for ADSB. So here's a poll question: Does your aircraft you own or that you regularly fly have mandate compliant ADSB out? So let me go find that. Um, there's my mouse there. Okay, so here's a poll, if you wouldn't mind uh, taking a minute. Okay, votes are coming in. I'll give it about three more seconds. All right, let's close the poll here. I'll give it another minute. There's still a couple coming in. All right, thank you. All right, I'm going to close it. Three, two, one. And let's see what we got. So look here. Um, do you do you own or fly an ADSB compliant aircraft? ADSB out compliant aircraft. So 20% of you, 19% have an Avidyne AXP transponder from Mode S, or you have 30% uh, of you have a, a some kind of Garmin transponder, the either the 330 ES or the other 340, 345, and then uh, a good number of you have the either an Apario or a Trig, or it doesn't have to be a transponder either. You know, Free Flight has the UAT product. Uh, BK has a brand private labeled one, and they also have a transponder as well. So no, but I plan to add it, 19%. And here, this illustrates 7%. No, and I really have no intention of equipping anytime soon. I mean, depending on the type of flying you do, if you're not flying uh, into Class B or Class C airspace, if you're... Uh, you know, there's a lot of wide open spaces in this great big country of ours uh, where you can truck along and never have to have ADSB. So if you're on an IFR cross country flight, you're going to intersect a lot of that airspace. And it'd be nice to be able to see all the airplanes. And that's what we're talking about here today. Here's one more question for the survey. Not one more, but another one. Um, Switch to the next survey question. Does the aircraft you own or that you fly have ADSB in? And you can see there's a couple choices here. Yes, it's installed equipment, so it's a it's a certified bolt-in receiver, or it's some portable like the Stratus or Sentry or GDL 39 or uh, GDL 88 or some other portable type device. Or uh, do you not have any ADSB in? All right, give it two more seconds, 1,001, 1,002, and we're going to close the survey and we'll share it there. So look here, yes, uh, it's installed. So half of you have uh, installed ADSBN, and I'm sure you're reaping the benefits of seeing that traffic. It's great. Yes, but I use a portal. So now we're 71% of you are at least getting some ADSBN um, in one method or another, and 29% are not enjoying that fine feature. So uh, for whatever reason, uh, but it's an interesting data point. I appreciate you sharing with us. You can see there is a mix out in the market in the in the, in the airspace that you're flying. So in summary, what's ADS-B versus TAS? This is a kind of a repeat, so bear with me, but the US mandate for ADS-B out, as we all know, is 2020, which is upon us, 1090 ES, is required above flight level 180, 18,000 feet. 978 megahertz UAT or 1090 is required below flight level 180. So either of those will work. All international mandates are for 1090 megahertz. There are currently no mandates for ADSB in, but you need a 978 megahertz receiver to get the free weather. 
A, the, one of the benefits of ADSB is it provides longer range traffic advisories with greater precision. So it's line of sight, and if there's some airplane way off in the distance spitting out, it's ADSB out, and on a nice clear day and uh, the spherics are such, you can receive that probably 40 miles away, 50 miles even. Uh, so you're going to you're going to receive that and put that traffic up. It's such a non-threat; it's almost irrelevant. But you're going to get longer range. Uh, all that really matters is the close-in range, and and again the closure rate issue. Uh, ADSB has limitations due to uh, altitude and line of sight. So in other words, you're not going to get the free weather if you're on the ground, or if there's a mountain between you and someone. There's a line of sight issue. Um, that sort of thing. But again, active traffic sees, the TAS sees all the traffic, especially valuable with mixed equipage and non-participating aircraft. It works in the US at all international airspace. And it's important even in an ADSB world, if I haven't said that five times already. So SkyTrack's overview, uh, what we've done is taken an active traffic and added ADSB in. We've got four different models with our SkyTrack series. So you've got the benefits of an active system plus the accuracy and extended precision of an ADSB in. Four different models, again, based on performance of the airplane. That's really down here at the bottom. Um, it's it's you look at the speed of the airplane and the type of aircraft they're going to be sharing airspace with. The fast movers, high flyers, you're going to want the, the 615 or 620. Uh, the lower, slower airplanes can get by with a 605 or a 600 even. And uh, you'll find that uh, as long as, you, and, and they're all designed so you always get at least 30 seconds of warning with it for with 1,200 knots of closure. So it, it, they're designed to meet those needs. There's an ADS-B range and there's a, uh, the regular active range is a little lower, but you get you can reach out a little further because of ADS-B. And again, that's for situational awareness. The components of the system, we have a processor, and it's interrogating other transponders 56 times per second to do those computations for uh, varying in distance. It'll track up to 50 airplanes at once, which is great in the high density areas like the LA Basin. Uh, receives also 1090 megahertz in directly from nearby aircraft and indirectly from ADSR if it needs it. And we have a technology called Veritas. It's it correlates the active and the age, so you only see one target on your display. Even though in this little example here, there's a Cirrus and a Lancer. It looks like if that Cirrus is receiving it, the, the the active traffic or the the SkyTrack 600 is interrogating that other airplane, it's going to get a reply back and and develop a a bearing and distance for that target, but it's also receiving its ADSB information, then it'll make that target much more accurate because it's got the lat long and velocity uh, component. And the Veritas actually uh, correlates that accurately. In the event the GPS isn't working as well or the ADSB fails, we're still interrogating that airplane's transponder and getting a, a position report. Top and bottom antennas. This is dual directional antennas. Each antenna has two elements, so it's four elements, uh, top and bottom, just like all the TCAS systems, dual top and bottom antennas, uh, which reduce shadowing, improve tracking. Each antenna has got two elements, so the single blade antenna has a front and a back uh, oriented antenna, and the, the dual blade or napkin holder antenna has a left and right oriented antennas. So between the four of those volumes of airspace they're looking at, you got great coverage, reduced shadowing uh, from its own airplane. The original TAS, the Sky, uh, excuse me, the Skywatch um, had a single four element antenna on the top of the airplane. So it, uh, depending on the airframe, uh, it would have a, a tendency to shadow and not see airplanes below it as well which could be a problem when you're descending. Uh, so, and as I showed in the picture earlier, all the TAS systems nowadays have dual antennas. And finally, there's a transponder coupler, which when your transponder's talking, it tells the TAS processor 
to it shuts down the receiver so that you don't see yourself on your own display what we call ghosting so uh the coupler is important for uh managing that another cool feature of the system is heads up audible position alerting virtually all the tcas and uh task systems out there when you get a traffic alert it says traffic traffic and you have to look down at the display to see where it is and then look back out and figure out where it's at with the TAS 600 now SkyTracks, we implemented heads up audible position alerting that we give you bearing relative altitude and range in the call out. Traffic, one o'clock, high, three miles. I'm immediately got my head out the window looking for that traffic. Then I can glance in and look at my display and kind of verify where I, if I'm looking in the right place. But it gives me that ATC style call out so I can get my head out the window faster. That's a really powerful benefit. Uh, we were the first to develop that. And since then, I think, I know Skywatch eventually had a software upgrade and uh, and the other products that came on the market since then are doing that. But that was something Avenine uh, implemented first. Nice, nice feature. And as typical for Avenine, we like to uh, be able to play in the sandbox with all of our friends. Um, we are trying to be vendor agnostic when it comes to interfaces. So we, uh, as just same with the SkyTrack 600, it'll work with virtually any of the uh, third-party displays out there. Uh, we've been uh, worked really hard at, at making sure that we're uh, working and playing well with others. And you can see there's a pretty pretty good laundry list. We've been out in the market a while. We've got over 18,000 of these active traffic systems in service in some of the busiest airspace and the most rugged environments. And you can see the list is long, uh, and this is just a partial list, but you know, LAPD, LA County, California Highway Patrol, this is the LA basin, the most busiest airspace in the country, if not the world. These guys have uh, our task systems on their whole fleet. If they get a new ship, they get another one from us. And these things are flying two hour sorties, 24 hours a day. They depend on and they rely on these traffic systems to protect them. You know, you got news helicopters flying around everywhere, uh, all the other things going on, uh, EMS, et cetera. Uh, so they're 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 very well proven and got a lot of experience, and uh, you can you can trust it. Uh, Airbus, uh, Leonardo helicopters that we're uh, offered at the factory there. They're a couple of our bigger customers, uh, and you can see the the list goes on and on. Uh, so it's you can feel confident that we've got a reliable system that's that's uh, Proven itself every day. I found this article doing some research for this presentation. Uh, this was from last January, Aviation Consumer, looking at TAS versus ADSB. And I like the headline, TAS still beats ADSB. It's born from proven TCAS technology. Uh, it's dependent on, not dependent on ground facilities. And all it needs is line at side of the potential traffic. So it's air to air. It'll interrogate the transponders of, of mode AC and SC transponder equipped aircraft and provide altitude and climb descend information. Uh, so uh, just another third party endorsement for what I've been saying here. Going back to the Skytrax pricing, uh, here's the four models and you can see the price points. We've gotten active traffic below $10,000. We were the first to do that. And then each of the different models uh, the beauty of this is, is you're not paying for more protection than what you need. And we've been able to do that and get price points that are commensurate with the uh, performance and certainly the whole value. A lot of these airplanes, uh, you know, if you're a high flyer, whatever, you're going to probably want to put the Skytrack 620 and it has, you know, virtually TCAS one type performance. So uh, that's, that's the list of that. And again, ADSB precision and extended range plus the autonomy of TAS. That's the benefits. And with that, I'll just say there's some resources if you're interested in more finding out more about Avidine. We have a YouTube channel, Avidine Avionics. You can find all kinds of videos, uh, testimonials, customer videos, how-to videos. And once you start watching one, you'll get a suggestion you know how YouTube works of you know a bunch of other third-party videos. Uh, you can learn a lot about the products there. We have an online customer forum called avidinelive.com. Go on there and 
get yourself an account. Just sign up real easy. It's free. And you can keep up with company news. You can find out information on upcoming software updates. If you're interested in what the next IFD software upgrade is going to be, include what's going to be included. You'll find it on here first. Uh, updates for legacy products like our EX500 and 5000 MFDs. Uh, so check that out. It's very informative. If you go to our website, this is the homepage behind here, tucked behind here. At the very top in the middle, you'll see a kind of a cyan button called Pilot Support. I encourage you to check that out. It's called our Customer Knowledge Base. If you have any kind of Avidine question, go in here and you can literally just type it into the search or put a topic in, or you can just scan the articles down below and find information on pilot's guides, warranty information, and how to activate your database, operational tips. There's all kinds of cool stuff on here. If you can't find an answer you're looking for, there's a place to submit a question and it'll open a ticket and our uh, uh, pilot support staff will follow up with you with an answer and most likely that question will end up in the knowledge base. So we appreciate, it's a living document. We appreciate you uh, uh, contributing to that and your questions are valued and we want to help you out. We made it very, very easy and accessible to do that. Uh, we've also launched uh, an Avidide Pilots Club on Facebook and more recently, um, a Latin American Pilots Club, which is kind of cool. So that's a great place to come in, uh, have community with other Avidine and like-minded customers, uh, post pictures of your panels, uh, ask questions. Uh, other pilots will chime in and give their answers and opinions. It's great. So check those out. We also have an Instagram page on social media. So uh, let's jump to another poll question real quick. We got a, two left, I think, maybe three. Would you consider installing an active traffic now that you have learned more about its safety benefits? All right, three, two, one, and we'll give it a minute. And then we'll close it here. And you can see it's a good mix. 45 42% said yeah, or 32 maybe. That's 75% right there. And 29, 26% said nah, for whatever reason. That's fine. Uh, another question here. Do you have a different time slot you would prefer for these webinars? Um, we do this webinar normally every Thursday at 1 p.m. And at... Uh, 6 p.m. I did them on Wednesday this week, but do you like the six o'clock slot? Do you prefer the current six o'clock? Do you like the one o'clock slot better? Would you prefer an early morning slot or an evening slot? We're we're flexible and we're, we're we just started back on these webinars and want to do whatever you guys find helpful. All right, I got a vote there, and we'll close the poll here and we'll see what it looks like. So those that are on the six o'clock like the six o'clock. That's uh, a good percentage. Um, we had a we did the one o'clock survey, and most of the one o'clock guys preferred the one o'clock. That's why they were on it. So that makes sense. Uh, early morning, I got quite a few of those on the one o'clock as well. So um, and even twenty three percent on the late evening. I know the European guys want us to do it early in the morning for them, and the Australian folks want us to do one late in the evening. So we'll certainly try to accommodate accommodate that in the weeks ahead. All right, Tom, you're getting a lot of a lot of thank yous from from several of the, the participants in the webinar. I want to thank everybody for uh, taking the time to join the webinar today. Stay safe out there while we're in this crazy lockdown thing. And hopefully uh, we get back to business as usual sooner rather than later. And hopefully we'll see you guys, some of you all at Oshkosh. Otherwise, fly safe, folks. Good night, everyone.